call Ms. Pooja Singh for our presentation. Very good afternoon to one and all present here. My name is Pooja Singh. I'm a PhD scholar working under the supervision of Dr. Raminder Kaur at the Department of Applied Chemistry, Delhi Technological University. So the topic of my presentation is synthesis of sustainable non-isocyanate polyurethane foams derived from xylose with enhanced fire retardancy. During the course of the presentation, first of all, I'll be introducing the background of this research plan as to what exactly are polyurethanes, why are they so important and what is the problem that has been identified. Literature review, which will give us an idea about what work has been done in this field. Then the objectives of the research plan. Afterwards, the methodology followed by the characterizations and finally the conclusion. So, polyurethanes represent one of the most important classes of polymers. They are uh, the sixth most widely used polymers in different areas of the industries. Conventionally, they are synthesized using polyisocyanates and polyols. When they are combined together, this leads to the formation of NHCOO linkage throughout the polymeric backbone, which is also called as the carbamate or urethane linkage. So there are multiple problems associated with these polyurethanes and their raw materials. As discussed, polyurethane, uh, polyols are used for their synthesis. These polyols are derived from petroleum materials. So uh, their expensive processing is a major concern that needs to be addressed, including the disposal and environmental issues that arise from them. These isocyanates are too much toxic and they also cause asthma, gastrointestinal issues, chemical bronchitis and irritation to the mucous membrane. Despite having so many disadvantages with their raw materials, they are widely used in different areas in the form of rigid and flexible foam. As we can see here in the pie chart, major production is done in the form of rigid and flexible foams. Then comes in the form of coatings, adhesives and sealants and elastomers. So in order to solve the problems associated with the petrochemical based polyols, the vegetable oil polio, vegetable oil based polyols are nowadays being used. Uh, this slide shows us a comparison between the two. The petrochemical based uh, polyols are found to be expensive since they require high technology processing system and huge amount of energy. Whereas the vegetable oil based Polyols are quite inexpensive since they are readily available and their biodegradation is also possible. Hence, they are non-depleting to the environment. But what about the problem that is associated with isocyanates? So this is how this is how non-isocyanate polyurethanes came into existence. These non-isocyanate polyurethanes are often called as hydroxy polyurethanes. I'll tell you why. So for the synthesis of these non-isocyanate polyurethanes, the cyclic carbonates are treated with diamines. This leads to the formation of two isomers. As we can see here in the slide, the two OH groups are capable of forming hydrogen bonding, leading to enhanced stability. As the, uh, as the presence of this OH group increases the stability of these materials, they are also called as hydroxyurethanes. Uh, most of the work done in the synthesis of non-isocyanate polyurethanes is in the form of uh, adhesives and coatings. Uh, various vegetable oils such as sunflower oil and castor oils have been used. They are first converted into epoxides. These are further oxidized and the polyols are derived. These polyols are then treated with carbon dioxide at high temperature and pressure which leads to the formation which further leads to the formation of urethane linkage when treated with diamines. So after undergoing this literature review, uh, some research gaps were identified such as these non-isocyanate polyurethanes which have been synthesized till now require very high temperature and pressure. So uh, the objectives of our research plan include the synthesis of sustainable nipu foams derived from xylose. Xylose is a wood sugar and is readily available. Then the characterization of these NIPU foams using SEM, TGA and FTIR. Finally, the study of flame retardant behavior of these synthesized NIPU foams. So this slide uh, gives us an idea about the synthesis of NIPU foam. First of all, hexamethylene diamine was allowed to react with dimethyl carbonate at, 60 degree, at 70 degrees Celsius. The reaction was continued for about an hour. And uh, afterwards, the uh, sugar solution of xylose was supplied to the material. 
the curing was done at 90 degrees celsius for about 30 minutes this is how the foam looked like uh, for the cross linking we've used citric acid as a natural cross linker which is this citric acid is acting as a natural blowing agent and also a cross linker so the synthesized foam was further characterized using <coughs> ftir and other other characterization techniques RxCl is the initial reaction mixture where, which confirms the presence of carbamate linkage throughout the polymeric backbone. The reaction mixtures named as RxCO, RxC1 and RxC2 contain different amounts of citric acid into the reaction mixture. As we can see here, the peaks around 3400 represent NH and OH stretching which is due to the OH present in the sugar xylose and diamine, hexamethylene diamine. The two peaks around 2900 are due to the sp3 hybridized CH stretching and the most prominent one around 1690 centimeter inwards uh, is due to the formation of the urethane linkage. So this peak confirms the presence of urethane in the synthesized foam. Uh, next is the SEM characterization of these nipple foams. As we can see here in this figure, the first a, uh, figure 6a represents the SEM uh, image of RxCO which contains 0% citric acid and on moving from A to C the amount of citric acid is increasing. So we can see here with increase in the amount of citric acid open cell morphology is observed and the cell size also increases. This is due to the vigorous reaction between citric acid and hexamethylene diamine. Afterwards thermogravimetric analysis of these foams were uh, were, were done and we found that the uh, thermal, anal thermal analysis gave us the result that the degradation has been uh, has occurred in three steps. Uh, first degradation from uh, 30 degree to 120 degree is due to the evaporation of water molecules and oligomers, access of acid and some other materials. The second weight loss step between 200 to 275 degrees Celsius is due to the urethane linkage uh, cleavage. The final weight loss step occurring above 400 degrees Celsius, which is also depicted by the DTG curves present, uh, it is due to the collapse of the polymeric backbone or the fragmentation of carbon-carbon bonds present into the polymeric structure. So, limiting oxygen index, limiting oxygen index gives us the value of minimum amount of oxygen that is required to sustain a stable combustion of a material. So higher the limiting oxygen index, high, more difficult it is to burn a sample. So it was found, it was found that uh, with increase in the amount of citric acid, the LOI values increased from 22.3% to 26.9%. So this, uh, this is due to the creation and densification of an isolation layer that grew larger with increasing the citric acid amount because citric acid is also acting as a crosslinker over here. So as a result, the uh, as a result, uh, increasing the amount of citric acid in the foam results in a greater barrier effect, leading to an improved fire performance. So following conclusions have been drawn from this research work. Sustainable xylose-based xylose nipu foams have been synthesized. They were characterized using a wide variety of techniques and their flame retardant behavior of these nipu foams were found to be comparable with the conventional polyurethane foams with added flame retardants. At last, I'd like to thank Dr. Raminder Kaur, my supervisor, all the faculty members and fellow research scholars. IPS Academy and the organizing committee for giving us the opportunity to present our work here. These are the references for the pieces of information that I've used for the exploration of this work. Thank you. Uh, are you studied about the reaction mechanism? Yes, ma'am, I can show you. Which one is the forming agent? Citric acid or your... Ma'am, citric acid is acting as a cross-linker and... Oh, ma'am, blowing agent and foaming agent both are the same. Citric acid is acting as... Yes, ma'am. So, this one material is playing a dual role into the synthesis. And citric acid is responsible for the, uh, the for presence of the foam. Ma'am, citric acid, since it is... Act it has multiple OH groups. These OH groups are capable of forming bonds with these NH 
groups present here so this will increase the cross linking behavior and citric acid also gives an exothermic reaction when it gets combined with the diamine so these uh, free amine groups when combined with citric acid they release high amount of energy that energy is used for the blowing or foaming process upon mr sarla yadav good afternoon everyone i am sarla yadav uh, present here uh, to present my our presentation on the topic biogenic synthesis of metal and metal oxide nanoparticles and its environmental application i am from dtu working under the supervision of dr poonam singh my supervisor and co supervision of uh, Uh, Dr. Raminder Kaur, my presentation involves introduction on the nanotechnology. As nanotechnology has been uh, has become uh, one of the most uh, multidisciplinary area of uh, science and technology, and playing a substantial role huh, in agriculture, environment, and pharmacology. Nanotechnology based processes are effective, modular, and versatile, offering high performance, low cost waste and wastewater treatment. In addition, nanotechnology can be expanded economically to clean uh, the water resources and uh, reuse uh, for uh, further applications. Nanotechnology involves the nanoparticles whose size lies in the dimension area of 1 to 100 nanoparticle on the basis of size distribution and morphology nanoparticles are broadly classified huh, into six categories first category is carbon based nanoparticles second ceramic nanoparticles third metal and metal oxide nanoparticles semiconductor nanoparticles polymeric na nanoparticles and lipid based nanoparticles my focus is on metal and metal oxides nanoparticle as metal and metal oxides are crystalline solid which uh, which contain metal as a cation and oxygen as an anion uh, in a cubic clause pack uh, structure uh, with enhanced physical chemical and electronic properties these metal oxides are easy to synthesize and shows multifunctional behavior they prep, uh, they uh, give a high conductivity magnetic and catalytic properties that's why they can, uh, they are widely used in environmental application now Uh, the uh, metal nanoparticle metal oxide nanoparticle possesses both the properties of metal oxide as well as nano uh, technology so these uh, uh, metal oxide nanoparticles are used because of their ease of synthesis and surface functionalization good chemical and thermal stability biocompatibility sur enhanced surface area and uh, wear and uh, scratch resistance on the basis of uh, the importance and uh, why we are using metal oxide these following properties are listed here first one is high surface area so they uh, they provide us more active sites for uh, adsorption and uh, photocatalytic processes adsorption and catalytic behavior due to the and uh, sur uh, active surface sites high stability semiconducting behavior size dependent uh, and ease of surface functionalization huh? these uh, nano metal oxide nanoparticles can be synthesized uh, synthesized by different method and these methods are broadly classified into two types first is first one is top down approach and second is bottom up approach top down approach is a destructive approach in which the bulk material is uh, uh, broken down into a small nanoparticles and the bottom up approach is a constructive approach from which nanoparticles are assembled from their corresponding atom molecule huh? and the top down approach involves a chemical vapor deposition method ball milling and mechanical milling pulse laser aviation splurting and pyrolysis second bottom up approach involves chemical reduction hydrothermal method sol gel method micro emulsion method electrochemical method and the green synthesis as all these methods except the green synthesis method have uh, uh, some drawbacks which are listed in the next uh, uh, slide the such as hydrothermal method provides a, a low output and a high uh, production cost sol gel method has a drawback like a low output and high cost chemical reduction poor crystallinity and presence of impurities ball milling method formation of product with poor uh, crystallinity and some uh, other uh, um, drawbacks are use of hazardous and highly reactive chemicals in homogeneity and poor surface area lack of stoichiometric control so on the basis of these drawbacks uh, uh, green synthesis approach is uh, now a promising method uh, for the synthesis of uh, different nanoparticles <laughs> by using different uh, uh, plants ex plant extract and uh, algae bacteria other biological molecules uh, like starch gelatin oleic acid yeast uh, fungi and animal extract uh, this is the basic methodology which is shown here uh, first of all we will collect i have shown for the plant uh, uh, use of plant extract uh, collection of plant part 
followed by washing, chopping, and the uh, drying milling. Uh, then uh, preparation of plant extract uh, using the uh, various solvent. Whether it will be ethanol, methanol, and water as per, per uh, the reaction, and then a uh, mat. Uh, the matter solution as well as ex plant extract were mixed for the uh, synthesis of uh, uh, nanoparticles. And this is a, this uh, last figure shows the uh, biosynthesis of metal oxide nanoparticle. So why question arises why biogenic synthesis is important because of its versatile nature, huh? good thermal stability, non-toxic and biocompatible product, excellent amphiphilicity, pH responsiveness, and provides high surface area. Uh, for more activation site, cost effectiveness. I have listed the biological synthesized metal oxide nanoparticles. For example, zinc oxide nanoparticles were synthesized using fungal uh, fungi and uh, agriculture filtrate of endophytic fungi, alternate uh, tensum, uh, which were further utilized for antimicrobial, antioxidant, and anti cancer properties. On the basis of uh, the following uh, uh, synthesis method and uh, mat of metal oxide nanoparticle, these following applications were listed. They are firstly used in uh, uh, first is uh, biomedical and drug delivery, second is optical engineering and communication, third one is the metallurgy, fourth uh, energy storage, fifth biotechnology, sixth textile industry, agriculture and food, and lastly wastewater treatment. Uh. So my focus is on wastewater treatment. Wastewater treatment uh, application is most important to get the clean water huh, by uh, by uh, sub adsorption and photocatalytic processes were utilized to remove the waste from water. And uh, these are the pollutants which are listed here like the dyes, pharmaceutical waste, agriculture waste, uh, heavy metals like uh, mercury, cadmium, plat uh, lead platinum uh, lead etc and microbes these are the methods which are used for the removal of toxic effluents first one is the physical method which involves adsorption process flocculation froth flotation and desalination method second is chemical method which involves electrocoagulation ion exchange and precipitation photocatalysis and reverse osmosis biological method involves the use of microorganisms and enzymes third table third shows a report mom next one is concluded Table third shows uh, reported environmental application of biosynthesized metal oxide nanoparticles. Lastly, future expect, uh, aspects and uh, challenges. Although an infinite number of uh, uh, nano, uh, nanomaterials are already available for wastewater treatment, the requirement for a novel uh, material have, uh, having a low cost, recyclability, and high efficiency uh, has still are not been fulfilled. Despite having a large number of advantages, drawbacks associated with the use of nanoparticles can, can't be neglected. To date, the challenge of scaling up the production of nanoparticles at industrial level is not yet addressed by most researchers. The research on metal oxide nanoparticles is still at laboratory stage and their commercial uses is a, a long way ahead due to several reasons. The nano, uh, nanoparticles may get discharged into the environment and accumulate in the nature uh, over extended period due to their minimal size. In addition to that, hazard uh, assessment of nanocomposites sh uh, should be considered and their consequences on ha uh, human health and environment must be studied. The fact that real water contains various uh, contaminants simultaneously is ignored by most of the research group and removal of mixture of pollutant is not yet been considered. So it is recommended to examine the performance of nanocomposite material in multi pollutant wastewater. Thank you so much. First of all, you are doing a review. Yes, ma'am. On metal oxide nanoparticles. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And nanotechnology deals with the particle size. So you didn't mention the nanoparticle size, first of all. Ma'am, because it is a review paper, that's why I'm saying. They also mention the characterization and also they mention the how much size they will But ma'am, how I can uh, review any other paper in front See, of the paper? I synthesize one nanoparticle and my nanoparticle is characterized by this particular method like SEM, 10 or TGA. Um, it's on a, re a revision paper, my, so I haven't mentioned that paper. The introduction, just take that uh, like the advice. In, uh, in okay, future, you have to yeah. mention all these points. Okay, first of all, nanotechnology deals with the particles. Okay, okay so you have to mention in your take review. It. All the particle size which are achieved by the researcher. Okay, okay. Okay, and you are dealing, uh, you are telling about the water. Uh, sorry, this what environmental man. application. Okay, and you, are, you also mentioned the wastewater treatment only, right? So select those people who have.
synthesize nanoparticle on the uh, uh, synthesized by uh, using biosynthesis method and then uh, so mention the their particle size, which characterization they are using, and uh, or, uh, how they are removing the uh, like ma'am in table and all. in table third I have mentioned the type method used. Which is adsorption, photocatalysis, and etc. And the uh, what is the reason behind how we can absorb that particular thing from that? Ma'am, because nanoparticles are in nano range and they provide more activation site and surface activation site, which can be confirmed by BET. BET data for volume and pore size. Mention just a one column. Okay, this characterization technique is used for this particular, like same time is for morphology, uh, TGM okay, for this. Uh, I understood your point. Okay. okay, and then uh, now applications so in wastewater treatment, what compound they are removing or they have studied. Okay, okay. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, one more question for me. Yes. Can we treat wastewater from leather industry by this? I'm, I'm not sure about it because I'm not dealing with that part. Now I call Ms. Gunjan Varshani for her presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Gunjan Varshani, PhD scholar from Delhi Technological University. I am working under the supervision of Dr. Ramida Kaur and Professor Mohammad Zulfikar, sir. Uh, today, my topic. Uh, is for presentation is cutting edge approach for latent heat storage fabrication of organic <coughs> waste change material with polymer shell so with the global economic growth and the population uh, explosion the rapidly increasing demand for fossil fuel leads to the shortage of uh, fossil energy sources and also brings some uh, environmental impact which causes global warming environmental pollution climate change and mass species extinction as you can see in the image the india accounts for 77 percent uh, energy consumption from the fossil fuel followed by the south africa uh, thermal uh, energy storage has uh, recently gained attention in order to curtail the retain extent of global warming and overcome the intermittency of the renewable energy sources uh, thermal energy refers to the process of capturing and storing the thermal uh, ener thermal energy for later use it involves the temporary storage of high and low temperature to balance the demand supply and uh, demand supply it also plays a crucial role for uh, uh, improving energy efficiency, optimizing energy usage and facilitating the integration of renewable energy sources into various applications. So thermal energy storage is classified into the three categories. First one is sensible heat storage, next latent heat storage and next one is a thermochemical heat storage. So out of all these, the latent heat storage that store and release the thermal energy at a constant temperature during the phase change, it involves the th internal energy into the matter, whereas the sensible heat storage store energy in release <coughs> without the phase change material, but there is a, vari a variation in the temperature. But if you can see in the thermochemical heat storage, uh, they release or store energy during the dissociation of the chemical bond. It doesn't involve the phase transition. It involves the charging, storing and discharging processes. A uh, phase change material is the form of the latent heat storage that are capable of absorbing and releasing the large amount of heat in the form of latent heat during the phase, uh, phase variation at the narrow temperature. Uh, they generally use the chemical bonds to store and release the heat. Uh, there are number of phase change materials that are available for the fabrication in various applications. It is generally classified into three categories. First one is the organic one which involves the straight chain periphenic hydrocarbons and uh, <coughs> non-periphenic for example the fatty acids and fatty acid ester. Next one is the organic phase change material which contains the salt hydrates metals and eutectic phase change material which generally contains the combination of two or more compounds such as uh, organic organic inorganic inorganic or organic inorganic phase change material so there are some example of the organic phase change material inorganic phase change material and eutectic phase change material along with their melting point and latent heat of fusion <coughs> So uh, there are some advantages and disadvantages of the organic phase change material and the others two also. Which one, if we are generally focusing on the organic phase change material, it doesn't show 
corrosion it generally has the good thermal stability no super cooling it will show and high heat of fusion but it has a number of uh, disadvantages such as it shows the low thermal conductivity and the volume change so how it is work uh, such a for example uh, see uh, fashion material in the uh, solid state as you can see in the blue ball shape as the temperature rise from the surrounding it will store the energy and uh, when it is in the liquid state and the temperature fall it will release the amount of uh, energy it is stored so there are some desirable properties for the fashion material for a particular application it is generally categorized for the chemical properties kinetics and thermophysical environmental and economical it show it generally shows good stability it doesn't show any corrosion flammability and phase separation it doesn't have to be expensive and uh, uh, thermal stability has to be done and uh, high thermal conductivity so uh, there is a several application of the fashion material first one is the building construction next one is aerospace industry solar energy storage refrigeration and cool chain textile clothing and so on but um, it has the major problems associated with it first one is the leakage leakage it will when it is changing its phase from solid to liquid or liquid to gas it will leak out uh, it will show the super cooling in concrete phase change and uh, long term stability and uh, expensive so to overcome from these uh, disadvantages and the uh, encapsulation needs to be done for the phase change material so what is the encapsulation encapsulation is the technique used to hold the material in a sealed container of certain volume in order to achieve the following goals first one to avoid the direct interaction between the surrounding and the material next one to prevent the leakage and to increase the heat transfer area as you can see in the image the phase change material encapsulated phase change material contains the two portion first one is the core one and the another one is the shell one core one contains our main the phase change material and the shell one contains the polymer shell or the inorganic <coughs> shell you can take uh, there are some uh, uh, and, uh, encapsulation can be done in the spherical form tabular form cylindrical or rectangular mm -hmm. in the out uh, other countries they are using in uh, phase change material in the aluminium pouches and uh, you, uh, users in the building application uh, other <coughs> other remediation to overcome this problem is the shape stabilized phase change material which it involves the fabrication by mixing the phase change material with the fab, uh, framework material <coughs> that are abandoned in porous structure or 3d network as you can see in the image a uh, supported material can be uh, uh, ethylene uh, glycol dynamite uh, diatomite high density polyethylene butadiene styrene etc uh, there are some literature review <laughs> Okay. Uh, conclusion the exploration of the organic material as phase change material for thermal energy storage application remains an underdeveloped the potential of polymer thermal energy storage particularly in encapsulated and form stabilized phase change material remains underexplored the extent of notable research gap in the need for enhancing the thermal conductivity of organic phase change material to achieve the rapid response properties in response to environmental temperature fluctuation references uh thank you uh ma'am i'm in the first year i already done the coursework and i'm setting up my trials right now literature review i'm doing right so you are completed your literature review i'm doing that yes it's yeah it's good now it's yeah it's the literature because uh, you are just telling about the latent heat storage yes ma'am yes ma'am uh, ma'am phase change material that we are, we are using as the latent heat yes ma'am that the encapsulated phase change material that i have explained in this these are not examples these are not example these are the just tell me okay type of that material sorry ma'am see uh, phase change material is that material that are used for the thermal energy storage 
for that it has a uh, question material has a number of problems that first one is the leakage low thermal conductivity incongruent phase change during the phase change it will not completely melt or completely solidify okay to overcome from these problems i am encapsulating this phase change material the core one contain the pcm that shows the leakage and another one oh, i am just asking about yes. the fabrication Uh, Ma'am, polymer shell that we are containing. So, how you can fabricate this? Ah, uh, there are a number of methods. First, ah, so I'm okay. asking this one. Okay. Ha. So, ah, uh, whatever uh, you are just thinking in your okay. mind, uh, ki what type of fabrication method you are using? That I have to explain. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Because one picture you are showing the foam yeah. structure and scaffolding. Yeah, scaffolding. So, which kind of uh, like you are using this method? Ma'am, so I am generally. The, Ma'am, these both <laughs> methods are capable to overcome from this, but I am generally focusing on the encapsulated one, uh -huh. because there is a number of applications that I can go through for just like thermoregulating fabric. Ah, uh, you have to mention the cost estimation also. Cost. Sorry? Cost estimation, like. Okay. Ma'am, in the out out countries, you it, mentioned that the uh, cost is, is it's cost too expensive. Costly. Yes, ma'am. So it's like ma'am one lakh for two fifty gram. <laughs> yeah, seriously, I we have already discussed for this uh -huh. because it very temperature sensitive. We can't work in the the in yeah. this this time. So it can be used in India. Yeah, that's why I'm focusing on that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Because here temperature is very. Ma'am, that's why. Uh, Ma'am, सर्दियों में इसमें काम नहीं हो सकता. Main बात ये temperature sensitive हाँ, इतना ही है. वही तो ये इतना sensitive है कि. लेकिन हम इसकी uh, application बहुत ज़्यादा है. इसकी जो temperature based है, तो उसके according हम temperature based उसमें ले सकते हैं. इसमें storage कर रहे हैं. Let's say storage कर रहे हैं. Yes, right. And then वो storage करने के बाद उसका utilization आप क्या करोगे? Ma'am, application में ma'am thermoregulating fabric. Like आपको सर्दी है. अभी इस time मौसम ऐसा है. लेकिन आपको क्या गर्मी चाहिए होती है. इसमें fabrication. स्टेबिलिटी के लिए मैम वही तो करा ना स्टेबिलिटी मैम इसको वो पॉइंट बता रहे हो अच्छा वो कितना सस्टेन करने का आपका मतलब नंबर ऑफ साइक्लिंग कितने हां ओके क्योंकि ये देखो अपने फेस ट्रांजिशन सीजन एकदम 3 महीने का होता है तो कैन बी इट कैन बी स्टोर फॉर द 3 मंथ्स नो नो मैम ऑल टाइम लाइक सर्दी से गर्मी गर्मी से सर्दी इट डिपेंड्स अपॉन द टेंपरेचर ऑफ द सराउंडिंग कि कितना है सॉरी यस सर Facial material can be used in clothing. Yes, sir. Can you explain that? Uh, sir, uh, for the uh, thermoregulating fabric, we have to choose which temperature we have to do. Like high temperature, low temperature. For the body temperature, thirty-five point five degrees Celsius, we have to take. And firstly, we have to synthesize for the encapsulated one, which can be in uh, inside in situ polymerization, emulsion, and number of methods that are available. If it is fab. Uh, completely prepared it uh, we have to coat it out whether uh, by uh, i have done my pro msc project from from this one only thermoregulating one so i have used the roller coating for this and uh, uh, so uh, we have to check the compatibility with the body compatibility <laughs> no sir human body because uh, i am asking of clothing for human beings yes sir yeah सर कोटिंग सम सिंथेटिक मटेरियल सर कोटिंग मटेरियल इट डिपेंड्स कि कौन सा है मतलब अगर वो स्टिक करता है तो उसके बेसिस पे हम देख सकते हैं वैसे तो सर मेन तो वही पॉलीमर सर सपोज इट गेट द और द शेल गेट पंचर यस सर देन व्हाट विल हैपन टू द सर दैट्स व्हाट वी आर डूइंग द एनकैप्सुलेशन वन इफ इट इज पंचर शेल कैन बी सर फर्स्टली वी हैव टू चेक द स्टेबिलिटी एग्जैक्टली या डिफिकल्ट है लेकिन पॉसिबल नहीं है कर सकते हैं गुड आफ्टरनून एवरी वन माई नेम इज अश्विनी कुमार तिवारी पी एच डी स्कॉलर फ्रॉम डेली टेक्नोलॉजिकल यूनिवर्सिटी आई एम हेयर टू प्रेजेंट माई टॉपिक एप्लीकेशन ऑफ मेम्रेन बेस्ड ऑपरेशन इन सेपरेशन ऑफ नेचुरल फिनोलिक कंपाउंड दिस पीपीटी इंक्लूड्स द इंट्रोडक्शन पार्ट मास ट्रांसफर मॉडल्स मैथडोलॉजी एक्सपेरिमेंटल सेटअप एंड प्रोसीजर results and conclusion coming to the introduction parts so phenolics are the compounds bearing one or more aromatic rings and i <coughs> have at least one hydroxyl group there are several phenolic compounds which are found in nature and have very useful are very useful due to their physiological properties like anti aging anti inflammatory and antioxidant properties these compounds found application in various fields like pharma industries food industries antioxidant industries paint and dye industries now coming to the importance of phenolic compounds in medical and food applications 
as i have already told that these compounds have very good antioxidant properties they are used to offer protection against development of cancers cardiovascular diseases diabetes osteoporosis neurodegenerative conditions these are the examples of some naturally occurring phenolic compounds now coming to the nano filtration process for phenolic separations so nano filtration membranes are semi permeable membranes that allow some of the species to pass through it based on the pore size so the pore size variation of nano nano filtration membrane varies from 100 dalton to 1000 dalton so organic molecules are concentrated and separated based on their size based on their size and on the molecular weight cut off of membrane now benefits of nano filtration membrane as there is no involvement of phase change so low energy is required no use of high temperature lesser chemical requirement concentration and purification step can be combined and it can run in a continuous manner and are easy to scale up now coming to the mass transfer models so there are basically three models which are used to define the mass transfer phenomena across the membrane that is solution diffusion model pore flow model and non equilibrium thermodynamics based model coming to the solution diffusion model it assumes that membranes are non porous in nature and the mass transfer uh, mass transport occurs through diffusion these are generally uh, used for reverse osmosis forward osmosis and nano filtration processes now coming to pore flow model it assumes that membranes are porous in nature and the transport occurs through these pores by convective flow so these are used for ultra filtration and micro filtration processes <coughs> then non equilibrium thermodynamics based model it is based on oswald irreversible thermodynamics air flux and forces are really nearly correlated and these are used for porous and non porous membranes <coughs> and uh, these are generally used for reverse osmosis forward osmosis and nano filtration process now coming to the method methodology in first stage experiments on model solutions were performed and analyze the effect of operating parameters in second stage mathematical modeling of the process was done estimation of transport parameters was done and optimization of different parameters was performed in third st stage experiments on natural products compounds will be done and scale up process will be done now this is the a systematic diagram for experimental setup it contains a feed tank having capacity of 10 liter two centrifuge uh, one centrifugal pump and booster pump a test cell and there are three walls and flow meter and pressure gauge are there to control the flow uh, flow rates and pressures now the specifications the maximum operating pressure for the test cell is 12 bar the active membrane area is 0.00785 meter squares flow meter having a uh, 100 to 1200 ml per minutes and a centrifugal pump of 1 by 4 horsepower and booster pump having flow rate of 100 gpd maximum pressure of 12 bar <coughs> coming to the results parts first of all hydraulic permeability of the membrane was calculated using the flux versus pressure graph of pure water at different pressures so by calculating it is found that the hydraulic permeability of the membrane is 5.15 to 10 power minus 8 kg per meter square pascal second it was calculated by the slope of the graph now mathematical modeling procedure so first of all estimation of theoretical values was done using modal equations by putting some random values of the parameters then estimation of errors between the theoretical and experimental experimental data was observed and then minimization of the error by using optimization technique and after after all data validation was used to check the uh, whether it is applicable in future or not now these are the mathematical equations which are used for the mathematical modeling and uh, simplex downhill optimization technique f min search uncons unconstrained non linear minimization was used for the process optimization all these equations are solved solved using matlab now coming to the member membrane performance so the effect of parameters like maximum uh, pressure flow rate and concentration on the flux and rejections was uh, was calculated and it was found that flux are increased with increasing permeate pressure with uh, and uh, decreases with uh, decreases with increasing compound concentration and if we talk about the re uh, rejection rejection is slightly increasing increased with increasing pressure and decreased with increasing concentration now effect of feed flow rates uh, the uh, the the variation of uh, flux is uh, almost constant for the 
flow rate this is due to the fact that we are using very low concentration and there is no concentration polarization found and the rejection value slightly increases with increasing flow rates so coming to the conclusion phenolic compounds can be successfully concentrated by using hft and f150 membrane with maximum rejection of 98% rejection value slightly increases with increase in pressure and flow rate but decreases with increase in feed concentration high pressure and high flow rate may be considered as the optimum operating condition for high permeate flux and rejection less energy requirement of membrane based concentration attributes to sustainable energy use and the concentrated phenolic compound can be further used in green synthesis for various applications at last i would like to thank uh, thank department of chemical engineering ips academy indore delhi technological university and my guide dr manish jain thank you Your optimization technique is simple. Simplex downhill method. <laughs> Why are you using this one? Ma'am, there are various techniques, but uh, it gives a result. And on research paper, I have learned that these are the basics. These are, uh, you know, there are three and four optimization techniques. We uh, means simplex downhill uh, method. It has F means search without n constraint optimization and constraint optimization. When I tried with unconstrained optimization, my optimization was uh, found having less error. Ah, uh, okay. And uh, which parameter you are using for the find out the error? Ma'am, I have a uh, hydraulic permeability, reflection. Which parameter for the error? Yeah. For error minimization. I am saying that, ma'am. We uh, there are four parameters. I am asking about the responses. Response. I, I didn't yes, get you. Uh, like concentration is your response. Right? Okay, 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 okay. Acha, you are asking about operating conditions. No, so, no. Uh, yeah. Because you are showing only single operating condition, <coughs> and in simulation you are just uh, showing multiple operating. No, ma'am. Actually, what the error optimization is for the model model equations. That is, that have three parameters. That is, hydraulic permeability, solute permeability, and reflection coefficient. The uh, that you are talking about the error. Error is calcul calculated between the theoretical values and experimental values. So, what value you are taking as a response value for the experimental and theoretical? Concentration, pressure, and feed flow rate. And uh, are you uh, aware about like comparison of that all the optimization techniques? Comparison of all the optimization, ah, ma'am. Actually, in F means search, uh, ma'am. Actually, what happens that in uh, MATLAB there are three and four methods. So okay. Are, uh, using optimization tool. Ha, optimization tool. We have prepared code. We have prepared code for that. So, or you are directly using optimization tool. Tool. Ha, present in the MATLAB. Ha, MATLAB. Okay. Thank you. Uh, again, it's okay. For the last presentation, I call upon Ms. Shruti Samantarai and Mr. Vidhi Sahgal. Uh, on the artificial neural network based modeling of hydrogen recovery through liquid membranes, I am Vidhi Sahgal and this is my research partner Shruti Samantarai. And uh, our work is also being uh, the, done by Adhya Roy who is not present here today. And uh, we are from Delhi Technological University uh, and we are students of chemical engineering B.Tech. And uh, we have done our work under the supervision of Dr. Manish Jain, sir. So, going forward. So, on the, on the background of the whole topic. So, uh, as we can see that uh, lately, uh, fossil fuels have been the cornerstone of uh, global energy consumption for many decades, providing the majority of the world's electricity, heat and transportation fuels. Uh, and the combustion of fossil fuels re releases large amounts of CO2 and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, contributing significantly to climate change and global warming. But uh, fossil fuel resources are finite and their extraction can lead to resource depletion over time. So, as we know that there is a greater need to transition to uh, cleaner and more sustainable energy resources. So, hence, we have found that uh, and uh, come upon a conclusion that hydrogen can be used and it can be the way forward. And uh, the reason why hydrogen has been chosen is because of five main factors, uh, mainly, of, mainly of its versatile applications. It can be used as a fuel, as a feedstock, as a heat source. It can also be used as a clean energy carrier. It is uh, very compatible to actually store and carry forward to various places and has great storage capabilities. 
it can be used in decarbonization of various sectors it can also be used in the energy storage and grid balancing and uh, and also there are several uh, sustainable programs in the world that are going on that promote hydrogen promotion and hydrogen fuel uh, usage over the world and uh, the reason that we need to actually separate hydrogen is because first of all uh, it needs purity requirements uh, the hydrogen fuel and electronics manufacturing do actually require a high need of uh, purity and uh, the safety of hydrogen is also a concern because uh, hydrogen gas needs to be separated from other gases and materials to actually prevent safety hazards in certain industries and uh, hydrogen production is also a reason that we need to uh, separate it as pure hydrogen can only be uh, obtained from through methods like steam methane reforming to obtain pure hydrogen from feedstock materials particularly and uh, we also need to store uh, for the the reason for the separation and uh, also there are environmental considerations like uh, uh, reducing environmental pollution and greenhouse gases emissions by the capture and utilization of uh, hydrogen from industrial emissions so we found that uh, we can actually work with liquid based membranes and uh, the reason why we have chosen uh, actually liquid based membranes first of all we like to give a background on why other membranes we haven't chosen and we are why we are actually going forward with liquid ones so the previous work with uh, cms membranes uh, as uh, as far as our literature study showed that uh, cms carbon molecular sieve uh, membrane reactors demonstrated that it is possible to obtain high purity hydrogen uh, when it is uh, when the membrane is used to separate hydrogen in situ and other inorganic membranes like palladium palladium alloy silicon zeolite membranes were also tested successfully but they faced challenges to be commercially viable and they cannot be scaled up and in a previous study purification of hydrogen from co2 was also done using new organic and inorganic and polymer based liquid membranes so the benefits of using a liquid membranes are uh, energy efficiency particularly the high purity that it can achieve and uh, compact design it can actually fit in various places so it will help in scalability and uh, also environmental benefits of the Uh, liquid based membranes so in particular within the liquid mem based membranes we have chosen mixed matrix membranes and uh, they are basically composite materials they are combine a polymer matrix with dispersed inorganic or inorganic fillers the polymer matrix provides the structural integrity of the membrane and uh, so moving on shruti will take it from here coming to artificial neural networks or as we call it ann so in recent years the ann approach based on artificial intelligence has gained uh, importance in modeling and simulation ann basically resembles the human brain uh, in the manner in which it understands and makes decisions ann has a significant advantage when solving a complex non linear problem ann is a powerful tool to solve complex problems in membrane separation modeling the membrane based separation process by ann is much easier than other modeling methods moreover the ann model can also be used when the physical and chemical parameters that govern the systems are not thoroughly no known and ann is used to model hydrogen separation using amine based ma mixed matrix liquid membranes in our study so the ann was trained tested and validated using the experimental data from a previous study and afterwards the effects of different input parameters on the hydrogen gas adsorption through the mmms were investigated so the ann based modeling uh, the anns are computational <coughs> models which are inspired by the structure and function of biological neural networks such as the human brain so it consists of these interconnected nodes as we can see in the picture called artificial neurons or nodes which are organized into layers and these layers typically consist of an input layer one or more hidden layers and an output layer so how it works is that the input layer receives the data the hidden layer processes the data and the output layer then generates the final results so a function defined as the mean squared error that is mse is used to measure the deviation of the generated results from the experimental results so mse gives an idea about how accurate the model is and the value of the node and the hidden layer should be chosen for which the mean squared uh, error is minimum so in this uh, formula that uh, that is uh, written here the n represents the number of data points y experimental and y model represent the experimental output and the model productions respectively so therefore msc represents the average absolute error in model prediction and is considered a data point thus minimizing the msc improves the accuracy of ann so the methodology that we have used here is that the ann was trained with experimental data from a previous study the trained ann was then used to analyze the effects of the different operating parameters 
and uh, the error back propagation operation was used to model the ANN. <coughs> so basically error back propagation is a fundamental and commonly used training method in neural networks and MATLAB provides a convenient platform for implementing this method. So the final results were obtained after training, validating and testing the experimental data. So gas adsorbed was the only output parameter which was examined in this study. So uh, the trained ANN was then used to analyze the effects of the different operating parameters. So the main operating parameters considered in this study are temperature and pressure of the hydrogen and carbon dioxide mixture, that is the feed solution through the NH2MIL53 membrane. So here as we can see that the, uh, the graph of the mean squared error and the number of neurons in the hidden layer show us that the value of the MSE was minimum with 20 neurons in the hidden layer. And the optimum value of the mean squared error with 20 neurons came out to be 9.2 to the uh, into 10 to the power minus 3. So it was in the range of minus 3. So uh, coming to the results. So basically, uh, a total of 30 experimental data points were used in this study. From this, 80% of the data points were randomly selected to train the ANN, 10% to test the ANN and the rest 10% were used to validate the ANN. So first number of neurons in the hidden layer was optimized to achieve the best performance. So these simulations were performed with varying number of neurons in the hidden layer and mean squared error was calculated. Uh, so the results that we can see here from this graph show us that the amount of hydrogen gas adsorption increases significantly when pressure of the feed solution increases from 40 to 70 bar. And the maximum amount of hydrogen gas adsorbed is at 70 bar, which is just 0 0.69 millimo millimolar per gram. So this effect can be due to the presence of a porous material like NH2MIL53 which we have used that can facilitate the transport of gases and higher pressure may help open up and enlarge the pores within the material allowing for a more effective gas adsorption. And the presence of amin amino groups in the NH2MIL53 can introduce additional adsorption sites for hydrogen molecules. So higher pressure might enhance the interaction between the amino groups and hydrogen leading to the increased adsorption capacity. Another trend that we noticed was that the amount of gas adsorbed increases with temperature with a maximum in the range of 75 degrees Celsius to 195 degrees Celsius and then it gradually decreases to become constant at 300 degrees Celsius. So the initial increase in the adsorption up to a maximum is because of the thermodynamic favorability of the adsorption process at higher temperatures. So the observed maximum in the range of 75 to 195 basically represents an optimal balance between the thermodynamics and enhanced kinetics. Change in temperature can influence the structure of the membrane as well. So the maximum adsorption at the intermediate temperatures coincide with the favorable structural changes that enhance the availability at, of absorption site. And then at higher temperatures, there might be a point where the structural changes or the thermal instability in the NH2MIL53 membrane leads to reduction in the number of accessible adsorption sites contributing to the observed decrease in adsorption. And then at higher temperature, the desorption decrease becomes more pro pronounced, leading to a reduction in the net adsorption despite increased thermodynamic favorability. <coughs> So uh, in the future, uh, the things that we are currently working on are the effect of different types of the NH2MIL53 membranes which are formed by varying the compositions of raw materials on the amount of hydrogen gas adsorbed. And then the effect of uh, the input parameters on other things like selectivity of the hydrogen gas and also on the uh, uh, on the permeability of hydrogen gas from the feed gas which has a mixture of hydrogen and carbon dioxide. So these are the references that we have used to conduct this experiment. Thank you. Thank you. From which composition you are separating hydrogen? It's basically a feed mixture of hydrogen and carbon dioxide both. Basically, we are not cut, we are not uh, conducting the experiment. It's already a previous study, a previous paper that we are taking from. So there they are introducing the feed gas of hydrogen carbon dioxide mixture. So are you adding only uh, the simulation? Yes, yes, the simulation, simulation. and the MATLAB simulation yes. here too. So are you doing coding or? Uh, yes. Yes, we are doing coding and we are using the neural net fitting application in the MATLAB to train, validate and simulate. Yeah. Thank you. Which, which task, uh, which algorithm you use for training the MATLAB? So as, we, as I said, the neural net fitting application in the MATLAB, so in that we input the, uh, the, we have the input set and the output set. Learning, 
Yeah, back propagation. Yeah, back I back mentioned that. So there are ways that I mean, like, eleven is there, eleven not. Eleven, eleven, eleven yes. How to choose the number of neurons? Yes. Sir, uh, so we are actually running the simulation on number of neurons and you know uh, uh, fixed gaps. So we are running around like in the this graph as you can see that we have actually conducted the experiments on various number of neurons and we are be, then we are actually seeing at which neurons we can get in the, the yeah, least error know. is there so that like here we chose the uh, 20 neurons because there we found the error was the least what is your error architecture like what is the number of neurons, what is the number of neurons, what is the output? Yes. What is your NM architecture? So we are basically using the Devenberg equation and uh, that uh, the whole framework. If the number of neurons is 4, and the middle layer is 5, one output neuron, then the architecture is 4 by 5 by 1. Yes. yes. What is your so that is 80% is getting trained, so there is like 10% and 10%. Sir, so is asking how many are Input, input, output. So in the input, we have about uh, forty. About how many data points were there? I think no, we had thirty-one in this. Thirty-one. Yeah. Is the data the David uh, divination? Yeah. yeah. So operating parameters are the responses. Huh. So output. Uh, in, input parameters temperature and uh, pressure, pressure, and the output parameter is uh, gas, gas itself. itself. So these are 30 and one output. Yes, yes. yes. So these are 30, 30. Number of neurons in So we are testing on different number of neurons. No? That is so the one that we have actually chosen finally was the one uh, 20. 20. Yeah. 20. Yeah. 20 I guess maybe because printing number is very large as compared to two and one. Yes. So we need to do some validation. Yes. We'll check on. Good evening, everyone. My name is Saurav. Today I am here to present my poster on the topic of advancing the thermal energy storage of the battery. So as you all aware that India is growing, so day by day we have a need of energy. Uh, earlier we used to produce energy from the coal, natural resources, but now we were shifting from the renewable source of energy as our government also working on it. So recently our Honorable Prime Minister has introduced the Global Biofuel Alliance. In that alliance, the many majorly developing countries are uh, come together to uh, make the energy from the solar light and also giving to the different different countries. So from there, I get to know why, like that the we have a lots of source of energy, but we never thought about the storage of it. So there I got a loophole. Let's suppose if we have a solar plant and it is producing almost a 90 or 100 percent of energy, are we able to get out the 70 or 80 percent of energy? No, there's a lot of wastage on. So we were thinking like how we can solve this problem. There we get to know that there are material called PCM. These material known as phase change material. These materials may have the prop, uh, property that they can absorb and emit the energies also. So from there, I think that we can use this. The energy which was come, uh, uh, surrounding or dissipating the surrounding, we can store and we can use this as a form of energy. But there is a problem. The PCM has a problem of leakage. How we can solve this problem? Then we think about the encapsulation of it. For encapsulation, we can uh, prevent the uh, leakage. And also we can use a different different application. If I give the application like recently in Ladakh, they have made a house using the PCM material using encapsulation. Because as you all are aware in Ladakh, there is a too much of cold. So people who were living inside the room, they want uh, high heat uh, sometimes at the night also. And they, uh, the material, the PCM which they have used, they can store the energy and release at the night. So from there, I think we can use this application in many, many uh, uh, different different forms. So these are the introductions of my project. As you can see, PCM are categorized into three parts: organic, inorganic, and eutectic. Organic mainly considers of paraffin, non-paraffin wax, uh, inorganic salt, hydrate, and metallic, and eutectic organic, inorganic. Then after that, we think how we can make the encapsulation of it. 
Then we prepare a polymer layer known as PMMA, polymethyl methacrylate. And the PCM that we have used in our project is the styrene. So what styrene have the property? Styrene basically absorbs the amount of energy and release which we can use. And I think you all are aware that recently that uh, Chandrayaan-3 has been launched. So the satellite surrounded with the PCM material. Why there is a reason? In Earth, there is a different temperature in this space, there is a different temperature. How we can save the satellite from the sun? Because the directly on the space, the satellite, the sunlight is coming to the spacecraft. They may can damage our satellite. So from there, scientists think, why don't we use PCM? PCM has the property to absorb and release the energy, which they can save the spacecraft, the satellite which is present. There. So this one is the again the application. Then we thought where we can use. We can use in fabric also. Recently, the some researchers also find that in winter season, we you can use PCM as a nanofiber, which we can use making in sweater, which will uh, warmer for the people who are using. So all these things we are currently doing. We were basically trying to make a polymeric layer, which we can use in different, different applications. But currently I am working on the thermal energy storage battery, how we can improve the efficiency. Uh, thank you. How the energy one stored, how it is released in which form it will be? Mainly it form, uh, 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 sorry, repeat. Like, if that material, if they are storing energy, hmm. and how they are releasing them? Like, uh, Dissipate. Uh, Basically, we have found out that, let's suppose we had, have taken the small battery, and without uh, encapsulating the PCM over the battery, we check how many days it basically works. After encapsulating that battery, how much amount of energy which we are getting. Let's suppose initially if it working on uh, two days, but after encapsulation that battery work for three days or four days, we think that the amount of energy has been stored. So we can use that form of energy. That, that's what I'm saying. How, how you are uh, reusing that energy? We are trying to store. Basically, actually we are doing it. So we are trying to explore more or more methods which we can do that currently. Okay. Thank you so much. Greet and accord, Dr. Payal Bhautik Ma'am with a memento as a token of gratitude. Uh, we'll start after a short tea break of 15 minutes.